praise the Lord, everyone. Can we stand together? Amen. We welcome you here to the opening night or summer youth revival. His kingdom, my choice. And I want us as we gather together just to make your way out of your pew and come on up to the front. We're going to have a time of focused prayer. Amen. So if you'll not be afraid, <laughs> just come on up. Everybody's going to be around the front. Amen. We're going to open up this service with our focus prayer. Praise God. If you've been a part of First Church any amount of time at all, you know that our theme this year is thy kingdom come. I felt very strongly impressed of the Lord as we were leading into this youth revival to off of that theme as a part of our youth theme, his kingdom, my choice. The reality is that in Matthew chapter 6, you've heard us mention this before, verse 9 and 10. It was a part of the Lord's Prayer, the guide that Jesus provided. He said, after this manner, pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. The reality is that his kingdom is going to come. That's the fact of the matter. His kingdom is going to come. But every one of us have an opportunity to buy in. Every one of us have an opportunity to make a choice, to make his kingdom our kingdom, to make his will our will. And so because of that, we open up this night with focused prayer. I want to declare to someone that this verse and this ideal isn't just mere verbiage that is spoken. It's not just words. It's a declaration. So as we get ready to pray, I want you to make a declaration to the Lord. God, if I haven't already from this point forward, I'm going to do my best to make your kingdom my kingdom and your priority my priority. You see, it's a life that's lived out. It'll go from this point as a declaration, but it'll become a testimony when you live that life out. It's a commitment to fulfilling the commitment that Jesus or the commandment that Jesus left for us. That commandment was to take up his cross and follow him. It's exemplifying the principle of not my will, but thine be done. It's an attitude to be a kingdom seeker. Probably read the book or heard of it at least, God chasers. Well, I want to chase God, certainly that is right, but I want to be a kingdom seeker. I want to become so passionate about God's kingdom. Whatever it is that excites God, that's what I want to excite me. Whatever it is that turns God on, that's what I want to turn me on. Whatever the Lord deems as necessary, that's what I want to deem as necessary. And so tonight as we begin this revival, it reminds you that it is a choice. It's your choice. It's my choice. It's one thing used to take control of. He leaves your choice up to you. It is the weapon that you have to inflict the most damage upon the enemy of our soul. That kind of makes me excited. Woo! Hallelujah. When I realize that when I buy into being a kingdom seeker, that I choose his will, that I'm going to inflict a whole lot of damage on the enemy. Hallelujah. So I invite you tonight as we open up in our focus prayer, go ahead and close your eyes lift up your hands and I invite you to open up your hearts in prayer and make a declaration to the Lord to begin this revival. I'm putting everything aside. I'm going to seek first your kingdom. I'm going to seek first your will. I'm on a quest to discover your purpose. 
purpose in my life. I'm going to be a kingdom seeker. I'm going to make my choice tonight to seek first your kingdom. We pray that right now, in Jesus' name, cover this group tonight. God, as we open up this revival, I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would transcend something inside every young person. Make them a believer, God, that you truly do have their
just to be closer. standing. I want to bring Brother Gregory Truitt to this pulpit. Amen. He is a young man as a part, uh, a part of our uh, Crosswalk Youth Group, an individual I am so proud of and I felt so strong to ask him to do a fiery five. I'm sure that he's going to be anticipating the moment that this is finished, but I can tell you, amen, that the Lord has spoken to him and uh, the Lord is going to anoint him and I want you to get behind him. Can you do that right now? Well, I would like to start off by saying thank you to Brother and Sister Milligan and Brother and Sister Pastor Phillips for allowing me to preach tonight, because I do not take this lightly at all. I mean, if you guys can tell, I'm kind of nervous, so just bear with me here. All right. Well, I would like to start off by telling you how I got the sermon, because I think that in itself is just awesome to me anyways. But. Well, I was at Obel, the Operation Behind Enemy Lines prayer retreat, and um, Brother Piercy had just got done preaching. And so um, we got into a little break stage, and then we would, then after that, Brother Huckabee would start preaching. And so, yeah, me and, me and Dylan, actually, we, um, we walked outside, and it was a beautiful day outside, by the way. Like, it was one of those types of days where you just want to just stay outside all day. But... Yeah, we couldn't, but it was all right. <laughs> but, um, so we walked outside, and I don't know why. I mean, I, I just looked at the ground, because it was a gravel parking lot. And so I looked at the ground, and I noticed all those, those gravel rocks. Like, because it was a gravel parking lot, of course. And, um, so yeah, I just looked at the ground, and I looked at the rocks. And I looked at them, and I thought, man, those, those are just some boring gray rocks. And I'm getting somewhere tonight, just hold on, oh, I'm talking about rocks. <laughs> but yeah, I looked at the rocks, and they're all just boring and gray, normal rocks. And I looked around for other ones, I don't know why, but I believe God laid that on my heart. And so I looked around, and I noticed that there is some of those like orangey granite kind of rocks just laying around. And I was like, okay. And, um, and I looked at them for a little while longer, and I believe God spoke to me then. And he told me, that's what we need to be. And I know that doesn't really make sense, but it's because they're different. That's what I'm trying to get at right now. We need to be different. That's what we need to be.
But yeah, they're different. I mean, we don't, we want to be those gray, I mean, not those gray rocks, uh, orange rocks. Um, because those are different and that's what we are. God made us different for a reason. And it even says it right here in the Bible. Um, 1 Peter 2, 9 says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that, he should, that ye should sue forth the praises of him with, who has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. And that, I thought that was awesome. Because when my dad showed me those verses, I thought, wow, that goes right with what I thought at Obel. And man, that's, that's awesome. <laughs> but um, we are a chosen generation. We are a royal priesthood. We are a holy nation. We are a peculiar people. <laughs> Basically what I'm saying is we are different. We are different because that's the way God made us to be. 1 John 4.4 4 says, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And after I heard that verse, I was just getting excited. I was ready. I was ready. Mm. But, yeah, I don't mean to make this sound self-centered, but we are better than the world. We are better than the world. It says it right here in the Bible. And we are greater. That's why we were those orange rocks. We are the different ones. We are the ones that are different color, shape, and size. 2 Corinthians 6.17 says, Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And there I thought, man, that's, that's awesome. Because um, it even tells us right here, to be separate from the world. Don't try to act like the world. We need to be separate. Because that's how you wanted us to be. And Romans 12, 2 says, And be not conformed of, to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You may be seated. But, yeah, and here it says, be not conformed to this world. That means don't try to act like the world. I know that's hard sometimes. I know it's hard to try to be the loner. But, I mean, that's how we were made to be. We are made to be different. So be not, don't be conformed to this world. Don't try to change yourself just so you can become more like the world. Because God created us better than that. God created us to be more than just some of those boring people that tries to bottle that truth up. <clears throat> and yeah, so don't be those boring gray rocks, people. Don't be those rocks that try to bundle up their truth and just hide it down deep inside of them. Because that's not what God wanted. That's not what God put us on this earth to do. He put us on this earth to spread that truth, spread it to every nation across the globe. So I come to you tonight. Don't be those boring rocks. Don't be the people of the status quo. Don't be those boring rocks. Those rocks are of the world. Those orange rocks are of God's little children, thus us. And God made us different for a reason, and that reason is to spread the gospel. So lastly, I come tonight, be different, people, because that is what God made us to be, and that's what God wants us to be. So why don't we do what God wants us to be and be different? Thank you. Come on, let's lift up the name of Jesus. We didn't come here to sit in our seats. We've come here to lift up the name to let God know that he is worthy. Hallelujah, neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm so proud of that guy. Hey, I don't even know where he is no more, but I'm so proud of that guy. Godly proud, as pastor says. Amen. Amen. Everybody say Cane Creek Park. 
Everybody say five dollars. Everybody say service tomorrow at 2 p.m. I've done my job. I don't, I'm just going to sit down now. <laughs> Amen. But uh, we do continue revival tomorrow at 2 p.m. And there will be a fellowship time after service at Cane Creek Park. Five dollars for food. Amen. Remember that, guys. All right. If ushers would come in time, I'm going to take up our tithes and offering. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, in your precious name, oh God, we ask you right now that you would touch the remainder of the service. Bless it, Lord God. I pray that you bless every gift and each giver, oh God, that is giving tonight, oh Lord Jesus. I pray that you would speak to us today. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Continue to worship with us.
of kings and the Everywhere you look, there was an idol, some little God. But he decided to declare out of his word, I looked around and I couldn't find a God. I am the only God. Today we are in the house tonight serving the God, the only God. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. we want it's his kingdom we choose praise God look around to someone shake their hand let them know how glad you are to have them here praise God thank you so very much every one of you that are here in our opening night of youth revival praise God amen especially our home folk and to our special guests, churches around the section that have come, young people around the section that have come. You've made our night to be a part of our youth revival. Why don't we give all of our guest churches and young people a hand? Praise God. Amen. Amen. And I'm going to be brief in my comments as far as uh, what I'm going to take a little bit more time on Sunday, but I do want to say how much that I honor, uh, appreciate and honor our senior pastor and first lady, brother and sister of Phillips, for their tenure and vision and leadership here at First Church, allowing something like this to happen. So why don't we give our senior pastor and first lady a hand? Praise God. Amen. Amen. And to our first church, Crosswalk Youth Group, pardon me just for a moment, the greatest young people in the whole wide world. Amen. I love you. Praise God. Where are you, Gregory? Where is he? Feeling a little relieved? <laughs> what an awesome job. Let's give him a hand. Amen. And the remarks that I will save till later, but I do want to just mention, you don't put on a weekend like this, an event like this, without having a lot of hands on deck, a lot of people doing things. You know who you are, and I'm going to mention you individually on Sunday, but thank you for making this weekend happen. Amen. Especially at a time when my wife and I were uh, just a tad bit handicapped with a newborn baby. Amen. You all have to do. I want us to bring our uh, to this pulpit. And I can tell you that he is a man that is very anointed. Has his hand upon him. His dad passed there. And uh, his dad was kind enough to me, fresh out of Bible school, to have enough faith uh, and courage to invite me to preach a revival for him. Uh, I will never forget the friendship, a long history there with father. I watched Brother Gallion grow up, even though there's 10 years in between us significant when you're, when you're younger, when I'm 20 and he's 10, and uh, whenever I got back from Bible school, I'll never forget the first sectional meeting, youth meeting, that I was able to be a part of. Uh, this young 13-year-old come running up to me and said, hey, Brother Milligan, remember me? And uh, I have to be honest, I was like, who is this guy? And uh, it was Brother Gallion, and uh, what a great history that we've had. We've hunted together, and uh, we've had uh, many times. There's something about Brother Gallion. I'm not sure what the deal is, but um, with two of our children, he happened to be in Memphis while we were there during the dedication. And now you're here the first night that my newborn is here. I think that tells me that you're never getting an invitation again. <laughs> Amen. I think we're done. But I want us to stand together. He is the campus pastor, him and Sister Gallion, at IBC Bible College, an elite, premier, uh, anointed Bible college in our organization. And they've asked to come and be the campus pastor of those students. And uh, I know, felt like the Lord directed me last year, uh, whenever he was a part of our camp, 
uh, our senior camp last year, I felt like the Lord directed me to speak to have him come and preach this youth revival. I want him to come to this pulpit unhindered under the anointing of the Lord with the word from the Lord that he's given him. Why don't we get behind him? Let's put our hands together unto the Lord. Brother Gallion. Well, praise the Lord, everybody. Amen, amen. God is good. Now, that's something to clap about, is he not? Hallelujah. Amen. Wow, I'd like to say this is a great privilege and honor for me to be here in Cooksville, Tennessee. I've passed through this area, but I've never had the privilege of stopping over, and it is a great privilege, privilege to be here, especially with my family, my wife, and my two boys, Grantland and Winston, and uh, so thankful that they're with me. It's good to get to know your senior pastor and lovely wife, and we have ties to Illinois. There's, there's a lot of connection to Illinois uh, this weekend, and, and um, he knew my father, they knew my father, my mother, who still live there, and uh, thank you so much for your kind words and for this wonderful privilege. Of course, it's already been stated. Very much, and I've had a wonderful connection over the years. It's been a lot of fun, and I have admired him, respected him, and considered him uh, someone that has spoken into my life more than once. And I thank him for his friendship and, and great kindness. And I guess if you're going to ask me to come preach, you probably should do it the day before uh, service starts. And that way you know that, you know, no kids are going to be born <laughs> when I get here. So maybe that, or, or, or just don't have me come back again. That would fix the problem if that's the case. And, uh, but what an, what an honor and a privilege it is. And uh, I will say that little guy is one handsome little fella. And, uh, man, I, I just... The only problem with babies is they grow up. They just, and before you know it, you got a teenager running around the house eating all your food and outgrowing all his clothes every week, and they're expensive, and, and uh, it, it happens quick, happens quick. Hey Amen. I feel good about this. Anybody feel good tonight in the Holy Ghost? Hey Amen. If you have your Bibles, I'd like for you to turn with me. I'm, I'm going to read a passage of Scripture out of Psalms 85. It's a rather interesting passage of Scripture. And then I'm going to reference the Scripture. We'll, we'll actually go ahead and turn there and read it. And we're going to read out of John uh, 19 and, and verse 30. John 19 and 30. But if you have Psalms, we're going to go to 85, Psalms 85. And we're going, to, we're going to take a look at verse 10. It's a rather interesting passage of Scripture and one that I... I kind of caught the other day, it, uh, it stuck out to me. It's kind of an odd scripture, to be honest with you. The scripture, uh, the Word of God is full of scriptures that you can read them a thousand times, and it seems as if you sit down in one moment and you open the Bible and begin to read. Something jumps out and grabs hold. Anybody that happened to you? I, I don't know how that happens, except it's a living Word of God, and, and whatever need you're going through and, and whatever problem you face, it's amazing how a book that is several thousand years in age given by God to humans, to men, to pin down the Word of God, the thoughts of God given to a finite mind, and yet God preserved this Word completely, wholly, and has given it to us, the infallible and errant Word of God. I believe that. Amen. Amen. I believe that whatever this Scripture says is exactly preserved in the intent and in the context in which God deemed it rightfully so. Absolute truth. And so here it is in Psalm 85, in verse 10, it says, Mercy and truth are met together, and righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Now turn with me to John. I'm going to take a look at John 19. I'll begin reading... In verse 28, it's a very sobering passage of Scripture here. This is a passage of Scripture we like to read on Easter when we remember that day, that sacrifice that Christ gave for us. And so here it is unfolding before us. It says, and after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the Scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I and now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar, and put it upon hyssop, and put it in his mouth. 
When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. I want us to pray tonight that God's anointing would be upon the, the remainder of this service, that he would touch me as the vessel that takes this privilege and this honor and this responsibility to deliver what God has laid upon my heart for you. And I stand behind this pulpit with fear. And I stand behind this pulpit because I know that every word that is spoken has the potential to shape and to mold lives. And so I will do everything within my power to preach to you according to what God has given to me. And I want to preach this thought, this message before we pray. I'll give you my title. It's simply this, the masterpiece of mercy. The masterpiece of of mercy. Let's pray. Can we just lift our hands and close our eyes one more time? Lord, we thank you for this great privilege to be here gathered together in your name. And Lord, we call upon that name, the name of Jesus, that's higher than all names. There is no other name that has the authority and the power. And in your name, in Jesus' name, we do all things tonight. And I pray for strength. I pray for anointing. I pray that you would touch every young person, anoint them and bless them and fill them and shape them and mold them and call them. And I pray, Lord, that this generation of army, this army of warriors, this army of saints, this army of anointed apostolic young people would take this word, this gospel that is sharper than a two-edged sword, defeat and push down the darkness that is coming against our nation and this army of anointed apostolic young people would deliver this gospel with authority and power and they would give it to the world that it might understand who and know who you are I pray in the name of Jesus let your will be done and everybody said in Jesus name in Jesus name amen you may be seated the masterpiece of mercy we think about masterpieces, we think about art, I think is where our mind would naturally go. You think about a beautiful painting on a wall, you think about a sculpture that has been carved, possibly of a human being out of solid marble, done with a chisel and a hammer. A masterpiece, something that is to be gazed upon, admired, something that is priceless or well, considered priceless, a masterpiece is something that I sure could not afford. No doubt that a true masterpiece is something that very few people could afford. Most of them are under lock and key, put in museums for all to come and gaze upon, admire the workmanship. Masterpieces. A masterpiece is also more than just an artwork created by human hands. You see, I believe there's masterpieces in the beauty of nature. Think about this beautiful state, this incredible place called Tennessee. One side is framed by beautiful rolling mountains covered in trees. Nice cold water that sprinkles down from streams and artesian wells. Bursts forth out of the ground, joining with other tributaries to form rivers. That wonderful little beautiful fish just waiting to be caught dwell in. That's a masterpiece, is it not? And then on the opposite side of the state, we have a massive flow of water. The cubic inches is staggering. The mighty Mississippi River that allows people to travel up and down and bringing freight and needed goods to far reaches as far as Minnesota to the Gulf of Mexico. Think about the incredible beauty that we share with the people surrounding us. And I had the privilege of living in Alaska for eight years of my life with my family. And, and there's something incredible about a masterpiece of God's beauty, a masterpiece on a cold winter night, 20 or 30 below zero. And you step outside and you walk away from the light of your house. You're engulfed in pitch darkness but only on the ground and not completely pitch darkness because the snow is a reflector of this incredible velvet sky with diamond stars that shine so bright and the northern lights are chasing those stars through the sky. That's a masterpiece of God's beauty, is it not? I picked up a book a while back. I, 
I brought it with me. It's, uh, it's not a poem book. No, I don't read poems. I read, I read verse. That's what I read, and, and I don't read from poets. I read from real men. You may know the man. It's called Robert Service. Maybe you've studied him in school. It's the spell of the Yukon, which is fabulous. But let me talk to you about a masterpiece of nature. Listen to this. It says, we sleep in the sleep of ages. The bleak and barbarian pines. The gray moss drapes us like sages. And closer we lock our lines. And deeper we clutch to the gilded gloom where never a sunbeam shines. On the flanks of a storm gourd ridge are black battalion lines. We surge in a host to the sullen coast, and we sing the ocean blast. From the empire of sea to an empire of snow, we grip our empire fast. That's a masterpiece, is it not? Me reading that, didn't that put you in a place so far beyond where we're at right now? A place on the coast, a rocky ledge that is pushing back the waves of a mighty ocean. The wind, you can hear it howl through those black pines that are amassed together to, to shelter a small hamlet tucked away in the nook of a mountain. That's a masterpiece, is it not? But oh, you see the masterpieces that man can create, it pales in comparison to the masterpiece of nature. And yet the masterpiece of nature pales in comparison to God's greatest masterpiece you see the greatest masterpiece that God ever created is not the mountains covered in snow it's not the oceans and the depths it's not the beautiful plains or the lush valleys no that's not God's greatest masterpiece you want to know what God's greatest masterpiece is ladies and gentlemen it has nothing to do with something external but has everything to do with the eternal. God's greatest masterpiece just so happens to be setting at the first Pentecostal church in Cookville, Tennessee. You see, God's greatest masterpiece is setting in the pew next to you. God's greatest masterpiece is not his earthly creation, but I'm here to say that you are God's greatest creation. Oh, you know what I'm preaching to tonight? I'm preaching to a generation of apostolic young people that have been called by God. You see, the day and the hour that we live in, God is calling forth His greatest creation to do His greatest work that the world has ever seen. You need to realize this, that the enemy would love to come against you and tell you that you are worthless, that there's no hope, that you might as well give up and walk out of the church but let me tell the enemy something tonight that God's greatest masterpiece resides in apostolic anointed young people that have been called by God to reach a generation that is lost and dying oh let me tell you we're not waiting for revival we are just waiting for a 12 or 13 year old to take up their cross and follow him you see, there's anointed in a person that'll say, I'll preach the gospel. There's anointing in somebody that says, I'll be used by God. It's the masterpiece of God's creation. Hold on, hold on. You see, the scene on top of Golgotha, the place of the skull was mixed with many emotions that eventful day. There he was, Jesus Christ, God manifested in the flesh. He robed himself in this carnal, finite flesh. He put upon him, he put upon him this robe that he knew would have to bear something that would be impossible for any human being to bear. And what that man did, he put upon him the weight of the world. Because every sin that was to be committed and every sin that had been committed, that flesh bore that to the cross. You see, the deity handled it, but the flesh was in a struggle. It was in a struggle to deal 
deal with the weight, the perversion, the darkness, and the pool of the sin. But oh, he carried it. It was not the weight of the cross that they made him carry. It was not the stripes that lashed into his back by that cat of nine tails that caused him to lose precious fluid through blood. No, it was not that that caused that stumbling weakness of the physical body. It was simply the weight of every sin that had could be or would be committed that was upon him. And he began to carry that sin upon that upon that rugged that rugged tree that was tied to his back and as he made his way to Calvary's cross he stumbled and fell they picked him up and grabbed another to carry it all the way to the top of that lonely hill they placed him upon it they drove the nails into his hands and into his feet they pulled on that wooden cross and now it was not just the weight of the world but the weight of his own body that began to tug and pull at those nails that had penetrated through flesh. Oh, he was there as the ultimate sacrifice for our sins. That cross began to shudder and creak and they dropped it into that dug hole. It slammed down, jarring his body, ripping his back and causing agony to ripple through that flesh. But oh, you see, he had a purpose. His purpose was a thousand years, two thousand years. His purpose was looking forward and to eternity time and saying it's worth every drop of blood. It's worth every pain that I have to bear. It's worth the agony of crucifixion because he saw a masterpiece. A masterpiece. When does a masterpiece become priceless? When does a masterpiece become priceless? becomes priceless usually at the death of the artist. Let me take you back a little bit, not as far back as the crucifixion, but you see there was an artist that couldn't make a living. He was a pulper. He was homeless. He lived on the street. He would paint hours each day trying to sell to passerby the canvas that he had worked so tirelessly on in the afternoon, but no one would purchase. You see, the time and air was the Renaissance, and nobody wanted his paintings because they looked nothing like the beautiful landscapes. They looked nothing like the peaceful colors of the Renaissance air. You see, they were bright and confusing, and they had no purpose, it seemed, and no rhyme or reason. The scoffers scoffed, and this young artist was troubled by it. He was a troubled soul. We know that. History tells us. He fought bouts of depression, suicidal thoughts. As a matter of fact, he became so low that he even mutilated his own body. He, he tried to cut his ear off. His only existence was a kind-hearted brother that supported him. He, he paid his bills. He, he gave him food to eat and rented a small room for him to stay in. Circumstances of his death are unsure, but he did pass away, and his brother went to clean out his small room. He finds hundreds of paintings, and not really knowing what to do with them, he's not an art collector, takes them down to a local gallery. He brings them in and says, listen, I, I, my, my brother was an artist of sorts, and can you sell these? Can, can, you, can you use them? And the gallery owner knew this man and knew that he had substantial wealth and as a favor because maybe he'll buy paintings off of me. He said, I'll, I'll see what I can do. I'll display them and, and maybe somebody will buy them. And year after year went by and no one purchased the painting. Finally, the paintings were put in the back room and covered with tarps and completely forgotten about by the gallery owner and the brother alike. And one day, a wealthy landowner walked in. He looked at all the typical paintings. He had hundreds like them at his mansion. He kept asking for something new, something fresh. The gallery owner had other customers to attend to him and finally said, go in the back room, 
room and, and anything back there's for sale, just holler at me when you find something and I'll let you know the price. And he made his way to the back room and began to pull paintings out from underneath canvases and tarps, finding nothing he liked until at the very back of the room he discovered it. It was a painting unlike any he had ever seen. The colors were bright, they were bold. They didn't fit in the Renaissance there. No, it was something of the future, something unique, something that no other art collector had. He called the gallery owner. He said, how much for this? I'll pay whatever price you ask. And that gallery owner, boy, he charged an exorbitant amount of money. And the landowner purchased that one and purchased as many as the gallery owner would allow him to purchase of the same artist. Today, you would find that painting, probably not at an auction, no. You might find it at a museum. And if you were lucky enough to attend an auction in which it was being auctioned off, it would go for millions of dollars. Vincent Van Gogh is the artist's name. His masterpieces were worthless while he was alive, but through his death, they became priceless. When Jesus on that cross suspended, the thoughts racing through his mind. Hear me, young person, every, every one of you that's here tonight, I believe that he saw your face. He saw your beginning. He watched you. He saw the end. I don't believe that there's one person here that your life is an accident. I don't believe that God made any mistakes. I, I don't believe that. As a matter of fact, I believe that your destiny is by divine order of God. I don't believe that you've been predetermined or predestined, but oh, I believe that God has a good thought to you. He's got a good thought to your end. I believe that there's a call of God on every person in this room. Though you may never stand behind this pulpit and preach a formal sermon, God's call is upon your life. God is reaching for you. You see, you are his masterpiece. As he was on that cross and those thoughts about us raced through his mind, you see, he had to say these words to complete the process. And the artist, the misunderstood artist, three and a half years walked among men that rejected him and laughed at him and mocked at him. But the misunderstood artist at that moment that he deemed necessary cried out and said, it is finished. Oh, you see his spirit departed out of that fleshly body. The flesh ceased to exist now in life, but the spirit began to take a journey. You know what he did? He made a way, young person. He made a way. He walked down into the pit of hell and he told the enemy, he said, Satan, I need the keys of death, hell, and the grave. You see, there's an army that I'm going to rise up in the last days and I'm going to pour out my spirit upon on all flesh and I need to have an army of apostolic anointed young people that'll go and take authority over the darkness of this world. You know what I believe? I believe that you've got more than potential. I believe that you've got anointing. I believe that if you just get it right, come on, if you could just get it right, if you could just get your heart in God's life, if you could get your heart in God's mind, if you could get your soul where it needs to be, if you could find an altar of repentance and not just live in repentance, but get up and walk the right path and you can walk with holiness and you can walk with righteousness and you can walk with justification and you can walk with sanctification. I believe that there's young people that can turn their world upside down. I believe there's young people that'll preach the greatest revival. I believe there's young people that'll reach the farthest reaches of this world. You see, here's what we're, here's what we're dealing with. We're, we're dealing with an enemy that's trying to tell you that it doesn't matter. We're dealing with a generation that has been raised up, that are walking away from truth. They're walking away from righteousness. Come on, young people. There, there's been men and women that have walked away and told you it doesn't matter, but it does matter because there's a call of God on your 
It does matter what you do. It matters how you handle yourself. It matters where you go. It matters how you submit yourself to your pastor. It matters what you preach. It matters that you get in the Word of God and you live it. You know why? Because this world is dying. This world is in darkness. There's no hope for them. They don't know where to turn to. But oh, we've got an answer. We've got an answer that can turn this world upside down. You know what we've got? We've got truth. That's what we've got. We've got the Word of God. Oh, I've got Acts 2.38 and that's enough. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Let me tell you, that's the answer that this world needs. Hallelujah. Let me tell you something. You know what your school needs? needs you. That's your school doesn't need your pastor. Your school doesn't need your senior pastor. Your school doesn't need your youth pastor. Your school needs you. It needs you to stand up and say, listen, I've got a word. I've got a word. I know what this generation needs. It needs Jesus. You can do it. You can do it. You can make a difference. You can make a difference. Oh, you got the answer. You know what you've got? You, you may not be able to teach a Bible study, but you can read. I, I believe that. I believe it. I believe that you can open up that Bible and you can begin to read the page of Scripture. Oh, they're anointed. You may not feel anointing. You may not understand what anointing is. But when you begin to read the Word of God, there's anointing that begins to reach forth. It begins to touch people's hearts. Let me tell you, you don't have to be eloquent. You don't have to be an orator. All you have to do is just say, here's the Word of God. I believe it. I live it. And let me to you. It's enough to change. You know what happens when we begin to play the blood of Jesus on something? You know what happens when we open up the Word of God? It begins to cause the enemy to shake and fear and tremble. Doesn't matter how old you are. Doesn't matter how young you are. You have the ability. Why? Because God created you. He formed you. He made you. You are His greatest masterpiece of all. Oh, let me go a little further. You know what the devil tries to tell you? He tries to tell you you're messed up. You're confused. There's no hope for you. Look at your mom. Look at your dad. Look at your grandparents. Oh, but hold on a second. Wait a minute. You know what? I don't trace my lineage through my biological parents. I don't trace it through my biological family. You want to know who I trace my lineage through? I trace it through a long line of preachers because I've been adopted by him. That's why I cry, I have a father. You see, I've got a dad who has a cattle on a thousand hills. I've got a dad who said, now you're a part of my family. Oh, let me tell you something, preacher. Let me tell you something, preacher. Guess what? You trace your lineage all the way back to the apostle Peter. You trace your lineage all the way back to Moses and Abraham. That's my grandfather and my great-grandfather. Devil, you know who you're messing with. You come against me. You come against me like a flood. And God said, I'll raise up a standard against them. Why? Because I know who my dad is. You're a masterpiece. You're a masterpiece. You're God's greatest masterpiece. You don't have to look like the world. You don't have to dress like the world. You don't have to try to fit in. You don't have to talk like them. You know why? Because you're not just a cookie cutter reprint of a has-been. No, 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 no. You know what? You are a masterpiece. Oh, God has said, I've separated. There's nobody like them. Oh, hear me. Young person, you, 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 may, you may say, I want to be like my pastor's wife or my pastor. I want to be like my youth pastor or my youth pastor's wife or my district youth. That's a good thing, probably. That's not a bad thing. Just, just say, but you know what? You, you're not ever going to be like them because God only created one of them. And guess what? God created you. He formed you just the way that you need to be. He made you exactly how he wanted you to be. And God put you at this time upon this earth and gave you a word. You've got a word, preacher. You've got a word. You've got a word. Masterpiece. Masterpiece. 
He did it through his death. God misunderstood ours through his death. There's a book, it's an old book. The True Heretics Please Stand. That's the title of it. It's an interesting book. It's about how when Jesus walked upon this earth, he began to train 12 unsuspecting, normal, average, everyday men. Some were fishermen, some were tradesmen, some were cheaters and liars. How they were. And God began to invest himself. You know, God's not looking for perfection. That's not why he called you. That's not why he reached for you. That's not why you're here. God does not care the state that you're in right now. You see, he's not finished. You come as you are. That's right. But God said there has to be the death. Paul said, I die daily. You know what he was saying? You see, something has to transform. We have to transform. It's called a new birth experience. Why is it called a new birth experience? It's because we go through a transformation. Old things passed away. We're a new creature. <laughs> you know what that means? Through the death, his death, allowed my old flesh to die. You see, I, I don't want the things that I used to want. I don't act the way that I used to act. When I come to him, you see, I, I lay that burden down upon an altar of repentance. And when I rise up, I've left that there. Let me tell you, repentance is a key, ladies and gentlemen. Repentance. Young person, repentance doesn't mean you say, I'm sorry, God, but I'm going to go back and do it again. No, repentance means that I'm leaving it here. You know there's deliverance through repentance alone? That's the whole. Repent means to turn and go the opposite direction. God can deliver drug addiction through repentance. God can deliver alcoholism through repentance. God can do that. He can, he can take away the desire for pornography and carnal lust through repentance. It happens through repentance. Let me tell you a masterpiece. Let me tell you a friend of mine. A friend of mine by the name of Andy. Andy's my hero. I, I love Andy. Andy Nyman's his name. Andy lives in a place, I, you may have heard of it. I don't know if you've heard of it or not. A place called Carmax Yukon. Anybody ever heard of that place? Nobody's heard of that place. Well, I didn't think so. There's only 200 people that live. It's a little village on the banks of the Yukon River. It's about six hours from the closest town, and that's Whitehorse, Yukon. Six hours of rough roads. It's out in the middle of nothing. There's nothing there. It's, it's just a little, there's a gas station, and the gas station is the grocery store and the post office and everything. That's the gas station. That's it. If you want something, you go to the gas station. You see, Andy has a problem. He grew up in Carmack, Yukon. He never knew his father. His mother was a drug addict and alcoholic. And Andy grew up in a home that was a mess. From the youngest of ages, he was exposed to things that, that no one should ever be exposed to, but Andy was proud. The Canadian government took Andy away from his home because it was unfit. His mom was unfit to care for him. And they placed him, they placed him into these boarding schools, they called it. He went into this boarding school, and I'll be very careful what I say. He went into this boarding school. And in this boarding school, there was a man that ran the boarding school. And the court system later said this, years later said that he had an insatiable appetite. You see, he abused these young boys. It started when Andy was eight, lasted until he was 10. Horrible physical abuse. I, I, I don't even want to, what, whatever you think could happen, it happened to Andy. And not just him, hundreds of them. And Andy said, I was damaged goods. Damaged goods. He said, at 10 years of age, we were allowed to go into town under supervision. He said, several of us boys ran away. He said, that's where we stole our first bottle. 
He said, I realized that if I took a drink of it, I could pass out or fall asleep and I wouldn't remember. And he said, so when the abuse would continue, he said, we would steal it and hide it. He said, and I was numb to the pain. Eight years old is when it started. At 10 years of age, he completely ran away from this boarding school, never to return. But from that moment on, Andy was an alcoholic. For 22 years of his life, he was an alcoholic. It led him to Vancouver, British Columbia, where Andy had nothing. But all he did every day of his life was score something to drink. He said, and when that wouldn't work, when the memory still came back and the thoughts came back, he said, I turned to hardcore drugs. 20 years drug addict, heroin, cocaine, LSD, anything that he could pump into his system, and he did it. He spent 10 years in prison. For 28 of those years, he was homeless. Absolutely, completely homeless. Andy now is a full-grown man. He's walking into the park. There's a convenience store across the street where he goes in. At the right time, he'll steal batteries. He'll take them down to the bar and sell them to purchase drugs and alcohol. He'll go back to a little room that he's rented. All it is is a small closet, dirty mattress on the floor, and a wash basin with old water. And that's what he's rented for the week. That's all he could afford. He shuffles, he's about to cross the street to go into the convenience store so that he can get his drugs, forget about the past. And before he can walk across the street, a man stops him and says, hey, I'm Jerry. What's your name? Well, I'm Andy. Hey, Andy, I have a question for you. My question is, can I pray with you? Why do you want to pray with me? And Jerry said, because God has got greater things for you, Andy. What can I pray with you about? And Andy said, well, you can pray that I, I, I get off drugs and I stop drinking. He said, and pray that I have a blessed life and pray that my family's okay. And that's it. And Jerry put his hand on Andy's head and began to pray. And he prayed for all the things that Andy asked him to pray for. And then he said this phrase at the end. He said, and God help Andy to find no pleasure in the drugs that he does. Jerry stopped praying and walked down the street, turned into an alley. And Andy said, wait a minute, what did he mean by that? And Andy said, I began to hustle down the street as fast as I could. My feet were hurting, my legs were hurting. He said, I get down, he said, I know that alley because I dig in that dumpster for fresh produce because it's across the street from a, from a grocery store. And he said, it's a blind alley, there's no exit. He said, and when I get down, I look into that alley and there's no Jerry there. And he just shrugs his shoulders, goes back, steals the batteries, sells them. He purchases his drugs, goes back to his room. He's sitting on his mattress and he fixes his first needle to inject the heroin into his veins and he says my hands start shaking I push the needle before I can even get it into my arm all the contents go on the floor I get angry and he said but something speaks to me help Andy find no pleasure in the drugs that he does I get mad he said so I, I've got enough I fixed the other I, I put the needle into my arm he said and I'm, I'm waiting and I thought well maybe I missed the vein and he says, I check, it's in the vein, and nothing, no relief. He said, God speaks to him and says, help Andy find no pleasure in the drugs that he does. He said, by now I'm a wreck. I can't hardly control the shakes. He said, and I, I, I grab some marijuana. I'm going to try to roll that. And he said, I, 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 he tries to smoke it thinking that there's going to be some relief, some, some help in this moment of desperation. And the third time, he said, this audible voice speaks to me and says, help Andy find no pleasure in the drugs that he does. Andy told me, he said, at that moment, I just lifted my hands and I cried out. And I said, listen, if you are a God and you care, you've got to help me. You've got to help me. You, you've got to help me break this addiction and turn my life around. 
And he said, as I'm crying out, he said, I don't even know what to pray. I'm crying out. He said, I begin to think, hey, there's a drug rehab center just a few blocks from here. He said, but that drug rehab center, I've tried to get in there, and it's a six-month waiting list. He said, so I turned to this voice that's been speaking to me out of the heaven, and I say, okay, if that's you, God, I'm going to call. I'm going to walk down the payphone, and I'm going to call that drug rehab center that's got a six-month waiting list, and you better open up a bed for me if you you really want me to do this, you'll have a bed open for me. And he gets up and he makes his way down to the payphone and he picks it up and he makes a collect call. Y'all don't even know what a payphone is. Maybe not even a collect call. He makes a collect call to a drug rehab center and they accept the charges. And he said, listen, I, I, I got a problem. I, I need to get in there. Can you, can you help me? Is there a bed available? And the guy on the other end said, you're not going to believe this, but five minutes ago somebody packed their stuff and walked out of this place bed's yours. It's got your name on it. And Andy made his way down there. And he said, I walked to the door of that drug rehab center and they handed me a towel with fresh clothes and a New Testament and some soap. He took a shower and got cleaned up. He said, I hadn't had a shower in years. He said, it'd been years since I had a shower. He said, I get out and I go over to the room they tell me I'm supposed to sleep in. And I kneel down at a bed and I open up that Bible. And he said, I start reading. I don't even know what to read. He said, but I begin to read and something gets a hold of me. And I kneel right there and I say, God, forgive me of all that I've done and help me. And he told me, he said, all of a sudden, I asked God to forgive me. I got tears streaming down my face. I'm crying like a baby. He said, I stand up. And all, all of a sudden, he said, I begin to smell something that I haven't smelled in 10 years. He goes, I, I begin to follow the smell. It takes me all the way down the cafeteria. It's bacon and eggs and coffee. He said, I walk in and I eat bacon and eggs and, and I drink several cups of coffee. He said, I haven't tasted food. I can't even remember when. He said, and I eat it all and I'm hungry. He said, you don't understand. He grabbed me by the shoulders. He said, you don't understand. He said, I'm coming off a 22-year drug addiction. He said, by now I should be vomiting and shaking and sweating uncontrollably. He said, I should be hospitalized with needles stuck in me and IVs. He said, but from that moment of repentance, God took it all away. You see, Andy was delivered. God set him free. And it came, you know why? Because God said, Andy, you're a masterpiece of creation. And I'm not finished with you. All right, hold on. Andy makes his way back to Whitehorse. He talks to his mama. You can be seated. His mama just so happened a few years before found a Pentecostal church in Whitehorse, Yukon. Brother Wagner is his pastor, her pastor. She introduces him to Brother Wagner. Brother Wagner says, Andy, I want to teach you a Bible study. He goes to the Bible study, Acts 2.38. He said, Andy, you've got to be baptized in Jesus' name. And after you're baptized in Jesus' name, you're going to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost by the evidence of speaking in tongues. And Andy says, all right, let's do it. They baptize him in Jesus' name. He comes up out of the water. God filled Andy with the gift of the Holy Ghost by the evidence of speaking in tongues. Something begins to happen. Now God steps off that cross and begins to paint the masterpiece of Andy's life with the blood that was shed upon Calvary. And God said, I'm not finished. You see, I don't want just a former drug addict. I want a preacher. And God puts a call to preach on Andy's life. And he said a couple years ago, he said, I walked up to a porch and I stepped on this porch and started knocking on the door. He said, I had to stop. He said, because I thought this porch looks familiar. I've been here before. And he said, oh, no. He said, a few years ago, he said, I passed out on this porch because I was drunk. He said, and the old lady that lived here kicked me three or four times the next morning, said she's going to call the cops if I didn't leave. He said, now I'm knocking on her door as a Pentecostal preacher, getting ready to invite her to church so I can baptize her in Jesus' name. 
God was not finished with the masterpiece. I'm preaching to you. I'm preaching to somebody in this room. Come on, you've come out of a mess. Your life has been destroyed. The devil's tried to lie to you. He's messed you up. You've turned your back against God. You may feel like there's no hope. You sinned again and again and again. But guess what? You are a masterpiece, and God's not finished with you. No, he brought you here tonight so that God can refill you, fill you with the Holy Ghost, wash your sins away, and make something of your life. God is the great artist and he's here to paint your life musicians are coming you see I wonder I wonder when he says finished the Bible begins to describe that at that very moment when he said it's finished something happened in the holiest of holies in the temple something took place you see there was a veil that separated the holiest of holies from the holy place. And the moment that he said it's finished, that veil was rent in two. You see, what took place was he was showing, God was showing, that now every person had access into the holiest of holies. Now that's important. We don't have to wait once a year you don't have to have a pastor or a priest to go into the holiest of holies you every one of you can step into the presence of God and feel his absolute undeniable love the same anointing now here the same anointing that is on my life on your pastor's life on your senior pastor's life the same anointing can be on your life the only difference the only difference is experience and appointment that's the only difference but you've got anointing on you you see there's not a person in this place that is not anointed by God you see when you pray things happen when you call on the name of Jesus things can happen you see you've got command of angels you've got authority over the enemy you are the masterpiece of God's creation you're the apple of his eye you can speak in his name and every devil in hell begins to fear and tremble at the mention of his name so that means that you can walk into your high school that may be full of drugs and carnality and racism and problems and you can say in the name of Jesus. You can walk into your neighborhood. You can walk into the worst neighborhood in Cookville and you can say in the name of Jesus. You can have every demon raise its ugly head and try to intimidate you and tell you what you used to be and where you came from and where you should go back to. But guess what? You've got a name. You're not just anybody you're a masterpiece you can look that devil in the eye and said I've got a God that loves me you know I wonder I wonder it's just my imagination I wonder when he said it's finished and that veil rent open I wonder that high priest that was standing on the inside that was rejecting Jesus as the Messiah I, I, I just wonder if he got his eyebrows and his hair singed completely off by the fire that left that holy stuff holy. I, I wonder. You know, why, you know why I wonder that? Because when God led the children of Israel out of Egypt, what did they follow? Pillar of fire. When they set up the tabernacle in the wilderness, how would they know that they're sacrifice of atonement was accepted fire would fall from heaven it would fill the holiest of holies I, I just wonder when that veil rent is that fire just sends all the hair off that high priest Whew, fire just shot right out see something had to happen because in the book of Acts it tells us that cloven tongues like as a fire fell upon each of them 
Do you know what used to happen here in Tennessee? I'm talking even before Azusa Street and after Azusa Street. Did you know that they used to have these Methodist holiness camps that the Holy Ghost would fall? They did. As a matter of fact, that's where we came out of, the holiness Methodist movement. They did. After Azusa Street, what happened? They began to baptize in Jesus' name and they were filled with the Holy Ghost. They received a revelation of the oneness. And we came out of that, according to Vincent Sanyon in his book, Pentecostal Holiness Tradition. Early Pentecost. I, it was before my time, Bishop. Probably before your time. You're a young man. But do you remember the stories? My, my dad would tell me the stories. Elders tell me the stories how they'd get the fire department called on them. Because people would say, that Pentecostal church, we see flames coming out of the windows. You think I'm telling stories? Fire department would show up and come into their services. And people would be speaking in tongues and running aisles. <laughs> Let me tell you something. Indianapolis, Indiana. Chief of police. Chief Hyde, incredible man. He's from Philadelphia. He's got connections to the PAW. So he knows a little bit about church. His chaplain, Chaplain Cody, is a PAW pastor. Chief Hyde, he said, the only way that we're going to turn violent crimes and bring the crime level down and change the neighborhoods is we've got to get churches and pastors on board. In the office. That's what he told me. Well, Chaplain Cody just so happens to be friends of Indiana Bible College and Pastor Paul Mooney. So we invited them to chapel. We didn't know exactly when they were coming. But as chapel started, I got a phone call in the middle of chapel service. So I accepted it. On the platform, all my students were looking at me going, what is he doing? And they said, the mayor, uh, the police chief is here, the chaplain, and four police officers, and they're coming to chapel today. They would like to address the student body. And I thought, oh man, they picked, they picked a doozy. Because that was one of those chapel services where they had already lost control of themselves. You know how it is? We were singing those songs, those one songs that everybody just worships. And, and IBC students are absolute, they're insane. They're just crazy. They come to chapel and they, they come to chapel. And they were running the aisles and dancing. And I thought, oh man, I, I don't know what's going to happen. But Chief Hyde is fixing to get his eyes open. And sure enough, in the middle of that service, kids run the aisle and worship and speaking in tongues and shouting all over the place. And they walked. Now, Chaplain Cody, he's PAW. So, man, he walked in, and he was shocked. But then he thought, oh, yeah. He, he knew we were having church. Man, he walks right up on the platform, and he starts, he starts dancing. Chief Hyde comes in, and he's completely blown away. But he's got enough church in him to where he's clapping his hands. Lieutenant Mann... That's the head patrol officer in our little area by IBC. He'd never been in church, period. And he walks in, and his eyes, and they get on the platform, and those other two officers. And people are shouting and worshiping. And let me tell you something. I watched Lieutenant Mann standing there. He's a big old brawny police officer. I watch tears just start flowing down his face. Chaplain Cody, he testified. Chief Height testified. They tore it up. They did. They, they, they were so excited. There was so much anointing in that place. They had to preach a little bit while they were testifying. And then Lieutenant Mann gets up, and he's crying. He said, I, I don't know what's going on here, he said. He said, I, I don't know what's happening. And he kept apologizing for his composure. He said, but the only thing I know, he said, is first of all, I didn't think that there were young people like you that even existed in this world. That's what he said. He said, and secondly, he said, what, whatever you've got in this place, he said, you've got to get it out there.
because those neighborhoods need it and those schools need it he never been in church before an unchurched police officer I don't know what's in this place but you let me tell you we've got a mandate from God to go ye to go ye you know what you're not just a masterpiece you're the masterpiece and guess what there's a whole lot of other masterpieces that you rub shoulders with every day that they don't even know their worth or their value because the devil's been trying to tell them you're nothing you give up you let go just forget about it you know what you've got a problem in your school and in your neighborhood and your friends they don't know who they are and sometimes you don't even know who you are but you need to stand up and you need to tell the enemy tonight I'm a masterpiece and I give my life to God All right, I, I'm, I've been trying to close. I, I'm done preaching. I'm calling every young person in this place, every person in this place, every person in this place that the enemy has tried to tell you to give up, that you've got nothing to offer, that you're a nobody, not talented, you're not called. He's tried to mess with your mind. He's tried to lock you up. He's tempted you. He's wrapped chains around you. He's brought up your past. He's brought up your parents and grandparents. Come on, I'm talking to somebody here. If the enemy's been trying to tell you something, I, I want you to step out of your pew. You don't even have to be a young person. I want you to step out of your pew, and I want you to come stand right down here at this front. Come on, you're sick and tired of the enemy trying to mess with you, trying to pull you down. Come on, you're tired of the way things are turning out in your life? Come on, we're going to make a declaration tonight. Come on, God is calling you. There's anointing in this place. Come on, get down here to this front quickly, quickly. Come on. Now I want you to do this right now when you get down here. I want you to begin to lift your hands. Come on, I want you to begin to plead right now the blood of Jesus upon your life I want you to begin to say in the name of Jesus Satan I come against you you don't know who I am but I am a masterpiece I am God's greatest creation and I'm not going back come on he's lied to you he's messed with you he's tried to poison your mind and tell you that you're a nobody but you are a somebody Come on, come on, I want you to pray. Come on, parents. Come on, chaperones. I want you to come and lay hands on them. Come on, that's it in the name of Jesus. This is an army. Come on, these are called by God. There's anointing in the name of Jesus.
listen to the Lord right now. What a beautiful presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. I feel like the Lord worked a miracle in several of these young people's lives tonight. I feel destiny in the air. I feel like that someone absolutely believed the message that was preached tonight. You understand that you are God's masterpiece. You made a commitment to him, and now the Lord is getting ready to life that is going to blow your mind. God anointing, God setting you apart, God changing you and make a difference in this world. Why don't we just put our hands together unto the Lord and thank him for the word. Thank him for his presence tonight. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God, praise God. Thank you, Brother Gallion. Amen. I could not ask for a better way to start our revival than this message and the response to the word and the spirit that I feel here tonight. Amen. Praise God. And I want to thank every one of you for being here. Be, be mindful that tomorrow, amen, our service is in the afternoon at 2. Amen. You can come casual if you like, or you can bring casual clothes afterwards for the, for the picnic. And... Uh, Cane Creek party, or everything that's going to be happening there. Pray the rain away. Amen. But come focused at our priority for a continuation of the Lord's word and for what he wants in our life tomorrow at 2. Amen. Again, to all of our guests, all those around the section and further. Amen. Thank you for being here tonight. Praise God. Can we just thank the Lord one more time before we leave for what he did in this house? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Amen. Amen. What a beautiful job by our praise and worship team tonight. Amen. Thankful that they led us a spirit of worship. We've got a treat tomorrow. Amen. Sister Gallion is going to uh, lead us in worship tomorrow. And then another anointed word by Brother Gallion. Another fiery five. And just, uh, I won't spoil it tonight, but we've asked a couple of our ladies to do fiery fives this weekend. Amen. So you're going to hear from one of them tomorrow. Amen. So we're looking forward to that. Praise God. And then I failed to mention Grant and Winston as they were able to bring their boys with them. We're so honored to have them here. Amen. At our youth revival. Let's give them a hand. Amen. Praise God. Amen. God bless you. Love you. Amen. We'll see you tomorrow at 2. Amen. Shake hands with someone. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.